Good evening and welcome to the Ann Arbor District Library's AADL TV YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in for tonight's presentation of Exploring the Mind with the University of Michigan's Department of Psychology. In just a moment, Christopher Monk will introduce our guests. If you enjoy this program, don't forget to click like below and follow our channel for more AADL programming. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us today. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Miles Durkee. He'll be presenting some of his very important work. Uh, Miles is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at the University of Michigan. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia in 2013 and was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Chicago. Um, Miles's research is focused on examining the dynamics of cultural invalidations, racial discrimination, and racial, racial code switching to determine how these types of experiences influence various outcomes like mental health and well being, identity development, as well as academic achievement. In this research, Miles examines how people of color navigate racial contexts, modify their racial behavior to fit in certain contexts, and internalize messages about their, cult their cultural authenticity from individuals inside and outside of the racial group. Miles's talk is entitled, Cultural Invalidations and Racial Code Switching, What Are the Psychological Implications? Here is Dr. Miles Durkee. All right, Chris, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I really appreciate it. So I'm excited to speak with you all today. Um, the title of my talk is Cultural Invalidations and Racial Code Switching. What are the psychological implications? So the work I'll pre be presenting today should speak to experiences that are very relevant for many people of color in the United States. Um, so the goal is to talk to you about these common racial experiences, introduce them from a psychological perspective, and to share with you some of the psychological implications of these very common day-to-day -day experiences. So for an agenda for this talk, uh, my goal is to present to you five exciting new studies uh, that my lab has conducted. So these studies fall across two main areas. So the first area is cultural invalidations. So these are identity threats that people of color oftentimes experience. And one of the most common cultural validations that we find amongst um, young people of color, young adults of color, is the acting white accusation. So within this acting white accusation that people commonly experience, I'll present two studies. Uh, one will describe the mental health implications of these dynamics. Um, the second will describe uh, racial identity implications over time related to these experiences. And in the second line of research I'll present gets at racial code switching. So this is the process of changing one's racial behavior depending on the context and who they're interacting with. So within racial code switching, one study will look at the factors that contribute to whether or not individuals tend to code switch. Another study will look at the various dimensions of code switching within the workplace specifically. And in the third study, we'll look at how the perceptions that Americans hold about individuals that code switch, whether they hold positive or negative perceptions about those individuals. So I first like to start off with a quote from one of our research participants. So this quote is from a black male participant who's 41 years old. And he says, I constantly dealt with people in white environments and black environments coming up with stereotypical first impressions about me. I was always too black to be truly accepted by most whites and too white to be accepted by most blacks. I used to try so hard to be what different racial groups wanted me to be. It became very tiring trying to be something different for others. So I really like this quote because it really captures the need and the necessity for my program of research. So on one aspect, we're seeing the invalidations that this individual is experiencing across racial lines. So from white individuals, he can never be fully embraced because he'll be perceived as too black. And then even from black individuals, he also feels a lack of being fully embraced by being perceived as too white. So there's a sense of identity crisis in which he's trying to figure out where to identify across this racial spectrum of identity. And then on the second line, you can see one response to this is that he's implementing racial code switching and changing his behavior, trying to appeal to different racial groups um, in different contexts and different settings. But he also highlights how exhausting and fatiguing this behavior and this dynamic can be of racial code switching and changing who you are to appeal and be accepted by others. 
So let's dive into this research. Uh, first, we'll talk about cultural validations. So this term cultural validations is likely new to most of you. Uh, this is a term that my research lab coined uh, last year. And we define cultural validations as identity threats that intentionally or unintentionally invalidate a person's membership within one or more social identities. So in my lab, primarily, we look at cultural validations along the lines of race and ethnicity. So oftentimes these are incidents where a person of color or any individual for that matter is perceived as an inauthentic member of their racial group. So by demonstrating behaviors that don't fit with the stereotypes or expected behaviors that others have for how members of their group should behave, that leaves individuals vulnerable to be accused by or to receive cultural validations. So some examples that people of color receive are examples of being perceived as not being black enough not being Latino enough or Asian enough or Hispanic enough. Um, and also too, or being accused of acting white is a very common experience too. By not fitting those expected behaviors for racial groups, then for people of color, oftentimes the default is then for others to assume that they're acting white or overly assimilating to white standards and white norms. However, as a framework for cultural validations, these same validations occur across all social identities. So. As individuals, we all possess many social identities in terms of our racial identity, our gender identity, our social class identity, our religious identity, even our political groups that we affiliate with. So across all of these various social identities, we have a set of norms and expected behaviors that we expect authentic members of those groups to embody and to demonstrate. But when individuals don't demonstrate those norms of the group, then that can leave them vulnerable to receive invalidations, both for members within the group and also for members outside the group. So switching back to the validations across the lines of race and ethnicity. So we find that particularly amongst young adults and young adults of color, this acting white accusation comes up over and over again when we ask participants to describe their experience or culture and validations. So what is acting white, okay? So as we know, there's no one way to act like any particular race. There's not a definitive answer of how to act white or how to act black or like any other race. However, this is a common, um, insinuation and accusation that does occur in the real world or real world or individuals accused of uh, acting white. So I like to use the broadest definition possible to describe these experiences of acting white. So I use a term from legal scholars to define it as a term used to describe instances in which people of color engage in conduct or activities that typically would not be associated with members of their racial or ethnic group. So in a way you can essentially think of these acting white accusations as labels to describe non-stereotypical racial behavior, okay? So when an individual behaves in a way that doesn't fit with the societal stereotypes of them, that can leave them vulnerable to be accused of acting white. However, given that we live in America, I want you to also keep in mind that when we think of the stereotypes that are associated with people of color and particularly more marginalized racial ethnic groups in the United States, unfortunately, a large part of these stereotypes are much more negative then they are positive for marginalized members of racial groups. So with that in mind, many members of those groups do not fit all of the negative stereotypes that are ascribed to their group. So by simply demonstrating normal behaviors that contrast with these negative stereotypes, you can see how it leaves the basis for these individuals to experience this acting white accusation quite commonly for simple attributes such as uh, getting good grades, being polite, being friendly, uh, being punctual. So across all these behaviors that are pretty normative and typical, members of particular ethnic minority groups have negative stereotypes associated with them pertaining to those behaviors. So to paint a little bit more context of this, these experiences of acting white, I'm gonna share with you a few excerpts from research participants um, that we collected. So these are real world accounts of college students describing their own experiences with the acting white accusation. So both of these excerpts I'm gonna share with you were collected amongst college students as soon as they arrived at college. So with the, within the first month of arriving at college. So the first quote comes from a black female college student. And she says, I used to get teased all the time by people of my race about not being black enough. And I was told that I acted white. A lot of people in my school didn't like me for that reason. So you can see the ostracism and invalidation she's receiving by being accused of acting white and being perceived as not black enough. This next quote comes from a Latinx male college student. And he says, in my schooling environment, oftentimes when I was referred to as white, it meant that I wasn't acting Latino, which was in regards to me not playing soccer, dressing well, getting good grades and having white friends. 
So in this case, across a series of unrelated behaviors, uh, this individual is being accused of acting white by not fitting the more negative stereotypes associated with the um, Latino population in the United States. So in the first study I'm gonna share with you, uh, my research team, we wanted to understand what is the internalized meaning of the acting white accusation amongst diverse college students. So in this study, uh, we recruited over 400 college students um, and they were interviewed as soon as they arrived at college within that first month. And we asked them to simply describe their experiences with the acting white accusation and we coded all of their transcripts. So four main themes emerged from how these students uh, described the acting white accusation. The first theme was describing it in terms of speech patterns and behaviors. So in terms of speech patterns, one particular aspect is the style of speech. So although the, all of the, our entire sample all spoke English, but the way in which they spoke English, the accent or dialect that they spoke English with was also racialized. So speaking one way of English with a particular accent was seen as more authentic for their group, but then speaking in standard American English was perceived as not typical for their group and could leave them vulnerable to being accused of acting white. Uh, also in terms of language for the Latinx participants specifically, not being fluent in Spanish was also perceived as others as a marker that they were somewhat less authentic or less authentically Latino. They also highlighted respectable behaviors, which are expectations to behave in a proper or pre preppy way. Um, and they distinguished these behaviors from pretentious behaviors, which are much more condescending elitist behaviors of oftentimes looking down on other members of their in-group. Um, and they described these as uptight, stuck up, or even bougie behaviors. The next main theme were fall along the lines of style and social preferences. So these varied across a range of different attributes that were all racialized. And within all these different social preferences and style preferences, there was a let's quote unquote right way for members of the group to behave and a wrong way. So this fell along the lines of clothing preferences, music genres, activities and sports, um, even uh, interracial friendships, and also food preferences as well, were all racialized. Um, an individual spoke to that kind of racial, walk in that fine racial line in these behaviors. The next main theme involved cultural ideologies. So along these cultural ideologies, there are two main sub-themes. And the first was cultural alienation. So this is described as individuals who intentionally aim to de-identify with the group in order to separate themselves from the stigma and discrimination that afflicts their racial and ethnic group. So intentionally trying to separate themselves from that stigma um, and, and um, discrimination by de-identifying with the group. And the next cultural ideology was described as normalizing whiteness. And participants described a strong level of frustration in response to this normalizing whiteness, because they realized that many traits in the United States that are just common for all Americans, we tend to racialize them and associate them with white Americans. And by default, many Americans demonstrate these behaviors. Individuals feel very frustrated that these behaviors are almost time synonymous with white behaviors and not just seen as American without having a racial um, overtone behind it. Then the last theme was academic achievement and success. So this is the theme that was probably definitely received the most attention in the literature and related to acting white and how it affects young people. Um, in our study, we find that individuals who were high achievers, they did report receiving um, some insults uh, from their peers for being a high achiever and that being associated with acting white. But I wanna make it clear that although they received these threats and insults, it did not deter them from their achievement. And in fact, several participants reported even being motivated to achieve even higher to start to disprove and dispel some of these negative stereotypes that are prevalent in America regarding the achievement of marginalized ethnic racial minorities. This is also similar in, in terms along the lines of career aspirations um, and life aspirations as well. And individuals felt motivated to try to break through a glass ceiling and to change expectations that others may hold about them in terms of their capabilities to succeed in life. So now that you kind of have a good sense of what the acting white accusation is and how it's internalized amongst um, people of color, the next step is to talk about now what are the psychological implications of individuals who receive these accusations? So ultimately, what are the consequences? So one of the first consequences that it does have major implications for mental health. And overall, across my own research and research from other psychologists, we find that individuals who are accused of acting white more frequently do report more severe mental health implications in terms of greater depressive symptoms and greater anxiety symptoms. So it does have an adverse um, effect on mental health. 
In addition to mental health, those who are accused of the acting white accusation more frequently also have negative implications in terms of their own racial identity development. So being accused of acting white is associated with lower racial private regard, and private regard is how positively you feel to be a member of your own racial or ethnic group. So that sense of pride. Um, and also public regard, which uh, acting white accusations have a negative implication on, public regard is now how positively you feel that society views your group. So for individuals who experience these accusations more positively, they then tend to view that society has a less positive view of their own racial group. So the next study I would like to present to you, uh, now that we know that these acting white accusations have adverse implications for mental health, we want to know, does the perpetrator of these acting white accusations have distinct implications for mental health? And particularly, are these acting white accusations more detrimental when they occur from a member within your own racial group, as opposed to a member outside of your racial group? So our first research question driving this study was, does the racial background of acting white perpetrators influence mental health outcomes during their transition to college for Black and Latinx students? So this is a longitudinal study where we sampled students once again, as soon as they arrived at college, and we tracked their experiences over that first year of college to see how their experiences with the acting white ac accusation had implications for their mental health at the end of that first year. And really, we were interested in whether being accused by a member of your same race was going to be associated with more adverse mental health consequences, because being accused by a member of your same race could trigger a sense of cultural betrayal that other members of your group now see you as a quote unquote traitor to the race, okay, or someone who's not working in the group's best interest. And that can lead to a very different process that can be more detrimental than if these individuals are accused by members outside of their racial group, where that sense of cultural betrayal may be less prevalent. So the next research question is that we also want to know whether a sense of racial identity can change these effects in terms of how the acting accusation is related to mental health outcomes. And particularly, we wanted to see whether racial identity centrality changes these associations. And centrality is the importance and significance that individuals associate with being a member of their racial ethnic group. So overall, how central is it to an individual's sense of self? Based, I'm, I'm sorry. So how central is the individual's uh, racial ethnic membership to their overall sense of self, OK? How important is that? And for centrality, uh, it was difficult to make hypotheses for the way that this would affect the relationship because it could go either way. So if we look at the majority of the research, look at a racial, I, racial identity in relation to racial stressors, typically having a strong racial identity is a protective factor in helping individuals to cope with racial discrimination because when discrimination does occur, uh, people of color can fall back on this secure identity to help them cope with that dynamic and make sense of that discrimination and to make the accurate attributions of why it may have occurred. However, when that perpetrator is now a member of your own racial group, that makes that coping process a little more difficult because for an individual who has a high level of centrality, so race is very important to how they see themselves, it could be the case that now when they're accused by a perpetrator of their own racial group, they could be more sensitive to these threats now. And that could potentially leave them more vulnerable to these accusations, given that to them personally, race is very central to how they see themselves. So it was an exploratory question. We wanted to know how does centrality moderate these effects? Is it a protective factor or does it exacerbate mental health outcomes? So for this project, uh, the data was utilized from the Minority College Cohort Study. And this is a longitudinal study that recruited Black and Latinx students from during the high school to college transition at five predominantly white universities in the Midwest. The total sample size was 533 students. Half the sample identified as Latinx, but within the Latinx uh, identification, there was some ethnic uh, diversity as well. 38% of the sample identified as Black, and there was also slightly less, but still some ethnic diversity within the Black population. And then 10% of the sample identified as multiracial, with at least one of their identities being either Latinx or Black. We did have more women in the sample than men, uh, but actually the skewness in gender distribution was representative of the actual gender distribution at the universities that we sampled. Where at each of these universities, when you look within the population of students of color, there were more women of color at these institutions than there were men of color. 60% of the sample did identify as a first generation college student, meaning that um, neither of their parents had achieved a college degree. And the median age at a uh, wave one, which is as soon as they arrived at college, enrolled in college, was 18. So just to give you a little background on descriptives on who these perpetrators are. Um, so we asked participants at multiple time points across the study. Uh, for this project, we use wave one, which is uh, uh, the baseline for the study. So that occurred as soon as they arrived at college and we had asked them to report retrospectively back to their high school experiences. So over the previous year is what the, um, 
the item in the survey asked for, which would have been their senior year in high school. Um, and then at a later wave, uh, which was the completion of their first year in college, we asked them to self-report over their first year in college. So we asked participants, what was the race of the individuals who accused you of acting white? And they had a checklist of multiple racial groups to choose from and identify who their perpetrators were. So we found that the most common perpetrators amongst Black and Latinx participants were members of their own same racial or ethnic background. So amongst those who did receive this accusation, 83% reported that the perpetrator was a member of their same race in high school, and 59% reported that was a member of their same race over the first year of college. Now, surprisingly, for both Black and Latinx participants, outside of being accused by members of their same race, most commonly, the second most common perpetrator for both of these racial populations were white individuals. Um, and we found that the rates of being accused by a white perpetrator was pretty consistent across high school and the first year of college in about a third of the sample who received that acting white accusation. And then just give you a little bit more background. We also wanted to know their relationship with the perpetrator. So I'll just give you these descriptives for, for this paper. We're not gonna go into much detail about the relationship with the perpetrator. Um, but as expected, we did find that peers were the most common perpetrators of these acting white accusations at 80% in high school and then 48% of the sample over the first year of college. Uh, but also cl amongst close friends, so distinguishing within peers, your close friends, half the sample received this accusation from close friends in high school and then only about a third over the first year of college. And the next for family members, we found that once again, about a third of the sample received these accusations from family members during high school and during the first year of college. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the results looking at mental health implications based on the race of the perpetrator. And we're going to compare different types of perpetrators, mostly same race perpetrators now to white perpetrators to see if there's different implications in terms of mental health. So I want, I want to walk you through uh, the multiple regression analyses that were performed uh, to test this question. In the first model, we're essentially testing for just the main effects of the perpetrators to see is there a difference in depressive symptoms over that first year of college. So you can see there's three different groups of perpetrators uh, that we're going to look at. The first is those who only received the acting white accusation from same race perpetrators. The next are those who received it from only white perpetrators. And the third are those who received it from both same race and white perpetrators during that first year of college. Now, each of these three groups are compared to our reference group where individuals who then never received the acting white accusation during that first year of college. So essentially you can think of them serving as a natural control group because they didn't have this racial stressor or this threat during that time period. So we wanna know amongst individuals who did have that threat from various perpetrators, if their depressive symptoms was significantly different, significantly higher than our reference group. Now in the second model, we replicate these same main effects, but now we account for several demographic control variables. Um, and these include the race of the participant, the gender of the participant, whether or not the participant is a first generation college student, and most importantly, the participant's baseline depressive symptoms at college entry to see if after controlling for that baseline depressive symptoms, if there's changes in the depressive symptoms by the end of that first year in college. And then the last model, model three, we now add in racial centrality as a moderating variable to see, does it now change that relationship? And we can test the specificity of that change in terms of whether changing the relationship for only same race perpetrator, only white or same race and white perpetrators. Okay, so in model one, we found that amongst those who received the acting white accusation from only same race perpetrators, and those receiving it from same race and white perpetrators, they reported significantly more depressive symptoms than the reference group who never received this threat over the first year of college. These effects held um, and stayed statistically significant even after controlling for all of our demographic control variables. Um, and you can see that wave one depressive symptoms was a very strong predictor of depressive symptoms than at the end of college. But even after controlling for baseline depressive symptoms, these differences still persisted. And then for our last model, model three, we're now gonna focus on the interaction terms primarily. We did see that racial identity centrality, so how important being a member of their racial group is to their overall identity. It did interact for individuals who only received the accusation from white perpetrators and those who received the acting white accusation from same race and white per perpetrators. But for this latter group, that trend was a marginal trend towards significance, but for only white perpetrators, it was statistically significant. So now that we know that it is interacting with the perpetrators, the question is, which way is it interacting? Is it a protective factor or is it an exacerbating factor that's worsening these mental health implications? So to do that, we probe that interaction effect and I'll present the results to you graphically um, in this graph. 
So first, I just want to orient you to the graph. So our outcome, once again, is depressive symptoms at the end of freshman year of college. And we're also controlling for baseline depressive symptoms, the race of the participant, their gender, first-generation college status, and the university they attended. So getting at how racial identity centrality changed these dynamics, we're going to probe it at three different levels. So first is that one standard deviation below the mean of the sample for racial identity. The next is at the mean level. And then the next level is those who are standard deviation higher than the mean level for racial centrality. And you can see our four groups here, the groups that are being compared, all to this reference group, which are those who never received the acting white accusation during that time period. So first I'll point your attention to the groups where there was no effect across racial centrality. So you can see for the reference group, across the three different tiers of racial centrality, there's really no effects. These levels of depressive symptoms are staying pretty consistent. The same pattern emerged for those who received acting white accusation for only same race perpetrators. We're seeing that their level of racial centrality didn't really matter much. Their level of depressive symptoms stayed pretty consistent. And at each level of centrality, this group always had significantly higher depressive symptoms than the reference group. OK, but for the group where centrality did really matter were those who only received the acting white accusation from white perpetrators. So you can see here when racial centrality was low, this group and all the other groups actually had significantly more depressive symptoms than the reference group. However, as centrality increases to the mean level, we see absolutely no difference between those receiving it from only white perpetrators in the reference group. And then surprisingly, as centrality increases, we actually see that those who are receiving this racial stressor, the acting white accusation from only white perpetrators actually reported less depressive symptoms than even the reference group. And we see a similar trend with the slope, but less strong of a slope for those who did receive the acting white accusation from both same race and white perpetrators. Okay, so for an additional outcome, we ran the same analyses now for anxiety symptoms, you know, to see if anxiety symptoms are having a similar effect to depressive symptoms. And that is essentially what we found. So very similar patterns where those who received the acting white accusation from only same race peers, and those who are receiving it from same race and white peers, they did report significantly more anxiety symptoms than the reference group who never received the threat. These effects held even after controlling for all of our demographic covariates and baseline anxiety symptoms at college entry. And then when we looked at how racial centrality moderated these effects, we did find a trend towards significance for those who received the acting accusation from only white perpetrators, but it did not quite reach the threshold for statistical significance. Okay, so what are the implications? So one, we find that mental health implications do matter based on the perpetrator of the acting white accusation. So specifically, being accused by a same race perpetrator we did find that it is associated with overall more detrimental implications for mental health. So this is a sign that cultural betrayal is likely playing a role, that when the perpetrator is a member of your own in-group, regardless if that's only the in-group or combined with white perpetrators, we do see this worse mental health consequence. And that could be because individuals may sense that by having the accusation from a member of their own group, others may perceive them as betraying uh, the in-group. And we find that racial identity centrality did serve as a protective factor to buffer against an increase in depressive symptoms, but only when a white perpetrator was involved in this acting white accusation. So we found that racial identity overall was not serving a protective role when the perpetrators were occurring from members of their same racial group, particularly when it was only perpetrators from their same racial group. So this suggests that the coping processes are likely entirely different based on the perpetrator of these acting white accusations. So when that perpetrator is a member of your in-group, it's likely that individuals need a unique set of coping responses to deal with this threat because it's likely this threat has different meaning compared to when they're accused of the same accusation from a white perpetrator. So this requires additional data collection that our lab is currently in the process of collecting data to understand how these coping processes look different when the perpetrator of these dynamics is from a different racial background. So for the next study we wanted to look at now, now that we know that they know a little bit about the mental health implications, what are the racial identity implications of these acting white accusations? So the first research question was, what are the longitudinal implications between the acting white accusation and racial identity development over time during emerging adulthood? So for this study, we looked at during the first two years of college, how these acting white accusations and racial identity influence one another. And essentially we wanted to establish or figure out what is the temporal ordering between these barrels? these variables. And the temporal ordering is getting at which variable is predicting the other variable over time. Is it that acting white accusations potentially serve as an experience that triggers individuals to think about the racial identity? And that experience of being accused of acting white can motivate 
greater racial identity development over time? Or is it that racial identity occurs first and that racial identity can determine whether or not individuals even experience the acting white accusation in the future, okay? So it kind of goes back to this classic question of which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And then in addition to that, we wanted to know whether the race and gender of the participant matters to determine if individuals from different racial and gender backgrounds are having different developmental patterns over time in relation to these two variables. So uh, I just want to note that across all of the analyses I'm about to present, uh, we did control for the socioeconomic status of the participants. Uh, we also controlled for their high school racial composition, because that can have an influence on their you know, early initial racial beliefs. And we also controlled for the actual university they attended. Uh, this is using the same data set from before the minority college cohort study. And I'll only be presenting the results for racial identity centrality, centrality where once again, centrality is how it, on this, the importance that individuals associate with being a member of their particular racial ethnic group. So overall, we found that race and gender mattered a lot, and there were distinct developmental patterns based on the race and gender combination of the participant. So I'll start with the developmental patterns for Black women. So just to associate with this figure, uh, we measured these effects across three critical time points. So the first time point was immediately at college entry as soon as these students enrolled in college. The next time point was the end of the first year of college. And the third time point was the end of the second year of college. So at the top, you'll see that we have uh, exposure levels. So the frequency in which they were exposed to the acting white accusation for each time period. And you can see that it does predict itself over each time period, so pretty stable. And then at the lower end, we have a level of centrality over each time period. And we also found stability and centrality in predicting itself over the time periods. So the most important aspect to focus on for this research question are these cross-lagged effects to see how is one variable predicting the other variable over time. So for the solid lines that indicates a statistically significant pathway and the dashed lines indicate that that pathway was non-significant. So for black women, we see that uh, based on their level of racial identity centrality at the end of freshman year of college, this had a negative association on their level of exposure to the acting white accusation during the following year of college. So for women, for black women who already had a high level of racial centrality ending that first year of college, they were less likely to have experienced the acting white accusation by the end of their sophomore year of college. Now for black men, we found a different pattern. So for black men, we found that acting white exposure, and this is acting white exposure during the senior year of high school, it predicted lower racial identity centrality development at the end of the freshman year of college. And centrality at the end of freshman year of college was again, inversely related to acting white exposure at the end of sophomore year of college. So if we think of this like a cycle, so black men who entered college, or I'm sorry, so black men who had a high level of exposure to acting white accusation in high school, they didn't experience lower racial identity centrality during the first year of college. And if they did have that lower centrality development over the first year of college, then that will make them more likely to even experience additional acting white um, accusations during the sophomore year of college, okay? So at each time point, there's an inverse negative relationship between these two variables. And then for Latinx men, we also found a different developmental pattern. So in this case, the pattern occurred between the freshman year of college and sophomore year of college. And we found that both of these factors, uh, there's a bi-directional relationship in which they both predicted each other. And at, across both uh, cross lag effects, it's a negative inverse relationship. So higher exposure to the acting accusation after freshman year was associated with less centrality development. And centrality development was associated with uh, inversely related to acting white exposure as well. So to summarize these effects, uh, this is once again, those same models plotted. Um, so for black women, we found a unidirectional effect where literally centrality is preceding the acting white accusation. For black men, we found more of a cyclical effect. That's this kind of negative feedback loop between these variables. For Latinx men, we found a bi-directional relationship in which both of these factors are predicting each other between freshman and sophomore year of college. And then surprisingly for Latinx women, we did not find an association between the acting white accusation and their level of centrality development. But I do wanna note that looking at the actual means of how often they were exposed to the acting white accusation, these Latinx women were still experiencing these acting white accusation threats at a similar level to their Latinx peers. However, these threats were not having the same implication for their identity development as it was having for their, their male counterparts. Okay, 
So covering summer across the big picture implications. So racial identity does have implications for the acting accusation. These two do inform one another. Uh, first and foremost, intersectionality of individuals' identity matters, okay? So race and gender played an effect here and there were different developmental patterns based on the specific race and gender background of the participants. So this indicates that the meaning making in which individuals were making sense of these acting white accusations and the racial identity development is important to consider because it's likely different across these different race and gender groups. Uh, particularly, we're really curious for the Latinx women. Why is it that for the other groups, there is an association between uh, racial identity development and acting white accusations, but we're not seeing that same association for Latinx women. Uh, so that's going to require additional data collection uh, that we're planning to pursue. Um, and really, it's going to require mixed method data collection. So we do need qualitative interviews to really understand and make sense of that meaning making process of what's why is there a disconnect between these accusations and identity development for that population. So keep in mind that across all the significant effects, this association between racial identity development and acting organization was always negative. Okay. So because this effect was negative inversely related, it does suggest that high racial identity centrality can be protective against later acting white accusations and lessening these accusations from occurring. This happened particularly for black women. But at the same time, since there were these inverse relationships, it also suggests that for individuals who have a lower level of development for racial identity, this could in fact also exacerbate greater exposure to the acting white accusation over time. And then once again, additional data collection to figure out the dynamics for Latinx women. So briefly, for future directions of this work, looking at the acting white accusation, ultimately, as you can see, mixed method research is definitely needed to unpack these dynamics. So we can understand a lot of things from quantitative inventories, especially plotting, you know, whether they significantly pre can predict other factors over time. But in addition to the statistical outcomes, we also need to understand what is the meaning that's taking place behind these, because there is different meaning in which individuals are making sense of these dynamics and internalizing them, and also coping with these effects as well. So now this is where racial code switching comes into play. Uh, so from the qualitative information we've collected thus far, we have found that racial code switching is a coping response to address these cultural validations. So for an individual who may be perceived as less authentic for members of their own racial group, even outside of their racial group, they can change their behavior uh, when they're interacting around certain people to indicate certain racial cues uh, to increase that level of acceptance with those groups, okay? So racial code switching in the process in terms of managing their racial profile, depending on who they're interacting with, who they're talking to, is one way to, um, a proactive way to cope with this threat of cultural validations. But as you recall from the uh, excerpt, the quote that I presented at the beginning of this presentation, racial code switching is not easy and is very tiring and fatiguing. So as psychologists in the next studies I'll present, we wanted to understand what are the costs and the benefits of individuals who engage in racial code switching. So to start off, what is code switching, okay? So code switching was first coined by linguists and it was used to describe the practice of alternating between two or more languages or dialects within a single conversation. So focusing on specifically one style of speech, code switching is switching between different languages entirely or just different dialects speaking the same language within a single conversation. However, psychologists have noticed that in addition to linguistic code switching, code switching can also occur across many other behaviors an individual's entire racial profile and how they present themselves to the, word, to the world. So psychologists, we describe code switching as the practice of adjusting one's style of speech, behavior, and appearance to mirror the social norms of others or particular context. So essentially adapting their own self-presentation to match the norms of the context of the people they're interacting with. So I just want to briefly kind of cover uh, some of the historical contributing factors that have contributed. Why is it that certain groups tend to code switch more frequently than other groups? So one aspect to consider is racism and class classism. So we do find that people from marginalized social groups uh, over time have had to learn and demonstrate the social norms of the more dominant group in order to gain access uh, to upward mobility and to get ahead in life. Okay. So if keep it in mind that the Gatekeepers and those, the, those who have more power in society have control over determining, dictating. Uh, one is uh, when individuals from marginalized groups can get access to certain circles, um, even certain education levels and certain careers and occupations to achieve upward mobility. So individuals from these more marginalized groups have over time have to learn to almost assimilate or temporarily switch on and switch off the behavioral practices of the groups that are in power to gain that acceptance into those circles. 
In addition to that factor, stereotyping and bias is also an important factor to consider because people from marginalized groups also face many negative stereotypes if we think about societal stereotypes associated with groups. Um, and code switching is an effective way to now manage their impression management when they are engaging with others and attempt to receive fair treatment and to be evaluated as an individual and not from the lens of expecting that negative stereotype. And the next dynamic to consider is cultural policing. So now this dynamic occurs oftentimes on the intergroup level amongst members from the same social identity. And individuals also face pressure to prove that they're still an authentic member of their in-group to other in-group members. So in addition to having a code switch towards the majority group in other settings, when they're amongst individuals of their own in-group, they can also have to code switch to prove to the members of the in-group that they're still, and quote unquote, down for the cause. All right, so in this study, uh, we collected, we conducted a mixed method study with around 300 black professionals across the United States. Um, all of these professionals were college educated and employed full time. And we wanted to know what are factors that contribute to the rates in which these black professionals code switch. So specifically we wanted to examine what are individual internal factors that are significantly associated with the rates of racial code switching and what are also external factors that are contributors to racial code switching. So in this study, uh, we found that uh, Individuals who did tend to code switch more frequently, uh, this was associated with them also reporting higher career and leadership aspirations, okay? So having very high aspirations to succeed in their, um, their current occupation that they worked in. We also found that these rates of higher code switching were associated with a greater perceived fit with the company culture in which they currently worked within. And we did find that individuals who did code switch more frequently also reported higher levels of vigilance. So vigilance is the anticipation of bias or discrimination to occur. So for individuals who have an anticipation that they might be treated unfairly, we found that these individuals tended to code switch more frequently when at work. Now, these are all internal factors leading to code switching. In terms of contextual external factors, we found that the racial composition of the workplace was significantly associated with the actual rates of code switching amongst these black professionals. But the trend of this effect was not exactly as you would expect. So we did find that for black professionals who worked in predominantly white workplace environments, they did report uh, higher than average levels of code switching, but they didn't report the highest levels of code switching. And in fact, individuals who reported working in the most racially diverse workplaces where there wasn't a single majority group, they reported the highest levels of code switching across our sample. So one reason why that might take place is that for individuals who work in very diverse workplaces, uh, throughout their day, they're likely having to code switch to different profiles, interact with members from different racial backgrounds. So if they're working from individuals from their same racial background, individuals from multiple other racial backgrounds, throughout the day, they're adapting their code switching in real time to interact with members from those different, uh, different cultural backgrounds. And in comparing that to individuals who work in predominantly white contexts, uh, if they're given that they're black professionals themselves, once they get to work, they're still code switching, but they can turn on one racial profile at work, which is to appeal to predominantly white audience um, in that circumstance, rather than having to adjust it uh, much more at a, a, a proximal level. Okay. So the next study was now getting at, now what are the different dimensions of racial code switching? And what does it look like within the workplace? Uh, once again, amongst black professionals. So for this study, we developed a scale to get at uh, racial code switching amongst black professionals. And within this scale, we identified that there are three main dimensions of racial code switching uh, for black professionals in the United States. The first dimension is downplaying one's racial identity. So some examples of downplaying racial identity um, are that these are instances where individuals intentionally try not to talk about topics that are racialized topics that might draw attention to their racial identity differing from the identity of maybe many, many other groups in their workplace. So this can include topics such as reparations, um, affirmative action, um, even events that occurred in the United States with police brutality and the killing of many black individuals that has occurred within 2020 and many years prior to 2020. So topics like this that are very racialized, individuals will downplay trying to bring up these topics because they don't want to draw too much attention to their race. And additional examples are individuals intentionally changing their hairstyle uh, away from a natural hairstyle to not draw more attention or fascination to their hair from their colleagues. That would then difference them or other them from the majority group in the context. And another example is, uh, Avoiding one example item from the survey is I avoid behaviors that will make other people at work think that I diff am different. So intentionally not trying to be perceived as an other or different from the core uh, 
population within the workplace. So in additional research and related to this specific dimension of code switching, uh, we wanted to know what are the costs and the benefits. So I'll present to you right now both the cost and the um, consequences of each of the three dimensions within our racial code switching scale. So we found statistically that uh, one, one benefit actually that's associated with downplaying one's racial identity is that it was associated with increased perceptions of professionalism within the individual's workplace. So for individuals who engage in this dimension of code switching more frequently, they perceive themselves as being perceived more professional by their colleagues in their current job. However, one consequence is that higher rates of downplaying one's racial identity was associated with greater feelings of inauthenticity uh, in terms of their racial ethnic affiliation. Um, it also was associated with a higher likelihood of being accused of acting white. Now, the next dimension of racial code switching amongst Black professionals in the workplace is avoiding stereotypes. So this was very explicit efforts to avoid chronic stereotypes associated with the Black race, very explicit stereotypes. So some example items from our survey include, I avoid behaviors that will make people at work think that I am, I am lazy. I avoid behaviors that will make people at work think that I am less intelligent. And I try not to speak too loudly. So across each of these dynamics, uh, individuals who are Black or African-American face very chronic stereotypes associated with these uh, attributes in our society. So these individuals report that they go out of their way to, to, um, to avoid demonstrating any cues that can trigger their colleagues or other individuals to think of them from that stereotypical lens. So some of the positive attributes that are associated with this dimension of code switching is that it was associated with a more positive performance evaluations. The individuals felt they were evaluated more positively in their current position. Um, they also reported increased perceptions of their leadership ability in their workplace organization. However, some of the consequences of this uh, dimension of code switching is that it was also correlated with just being more emotionally taxing overall. Um, and one participant actually responded with feeling the need to have to work twice as hard only to get half as far because of these chronic stereotypes that kind of can hold their members of the racial ethnic group back from getting ahead and being perceived as um, deserving of promotion and hiring. They felt that they do have to work twice as hard to circumvent these negative stereotypes. Um, and this dimension of code switching was also statistically associated with higher levels of burnout in their current workplace uh, Okay, and then the third dimension of racial code switching is expressing shared interests with the dominant group. So this is intentional efforts of individuals going out of their way to learn about the hobbies and interests of the dominant group in their workplace to then embody those uh, hobbies and interests to now perceive, be perceived more as a member of the in-group rather than a member of the out-group. So two example items are, I try to talk about topics that other people would find interesting at work regardless of whether the black professional finds interesting themselves. Um, and another item is I try to familiar, familiarize myself with interests and hobbies that people at work find interesting. So this can include hobbies such as golf, hockey, um, even other current events that individuals, you know, maybe not interested in themselves, but they find that it can be very beneficial to learn about those hobbies and able to have that small talk in, um, in their workplace uh, that's critical to developing strong workplace uh, relationships. So some positive outcomes of this dimension of code switching is that it was associated with individuals reporting uh, closer workplace relationships. Um, they also reported that it increased their chances of getting a promotion um, in their current uh, workplace. Now, some of the consequences is that by, by these individuals engaging in this type of code switching, um, they did report there are qualitative responses that one fear is that it can create very unrealistic expectations for all Black employees. So if this if that one particular individual tends to code switch in this way, then one scary factor is that if they're a token individual representing their whole group and they code switch in that way, that it could set this expectation that now all other individuals who follow them in that workplace are also expected to learn and embody the same exact interests of the dominant group. And that's really just naturally an unexpected, unrealistic expectation of workers in any workplace. So that is one potential cost. Okay, and now for the final study. Um, now that we know um, more about the um, nature, the contributing factors to code switching, um, what the dimensions of code switching look like, and some of the costs and benefits of code switching, we wanted to get a sense of how do Americans feel about Black professionals who code switch? So through an experimental study, we manipulated uh, profiles of a Black professional who either engaged in explicit code switching or did not engage in code switching. And we wanted to know how do Americans judge the professionalism of that individual? Is there an advantage to code switching or is there a consequence? 
So this was an experimental study that manipulated whether a black coworker um, engaged in racial code switching at work. So participants in the study received uh, an email from a fictional coworker, and in this email, the coworker is giving participants advice on the unspoken ways to succeed at the law firm that participants were told to imagine themselves they were just hired at. So in this email, the participant in the email, uh, there were two different conditions. One condition was the code switching condition in which they code switch across three behaviors. And the other condition, they did not code switch across those three same behaviors. So the three behaviors that we particularly manipulated for code switching was, first was name preference. So for name preference, the individual who code switched intentionally went by a different name than their first name. They went by a name that sounded more European in their workplace, but they reported outside of their workplace going by their first name. And in the non-code switching variant, individual went by the same name, regardless of context. And then for style of speech, in the code switching condition, um, the individual reported intentionally changing their style of speech only at work uh, to be perceived as more professional, but then outside of work speaking more naturally. And in the non-code switching condition, the individual reported not changing their style of speech uh, between work and outside of work. The last condition was hairstyle. In the code switching condition, the individual reported intentionally changing their hairstyle for the workplace. And that included either for the female variant, straightening their hair, which is more of a European kind of aesthetic for um, hairstyle. And then for the male variant, it was cleaning, keeping a very close cut uh, hair, haircut. The non code switching variant was wearing a more natural hairstyle. Um, Yes, so for this study, uh, there were 400 uh, black and white adults who were recruited online um, for the study. Rec they were recruited through MTurk. So I'll jump into the outcome for professionalism. And we found that there was an interaction for perceived professionalism. So um, for, and we also gender matched the gender of the uh, the hypothetical coworker in the email to the gender of the actual participant. So that really we can distinguish across racial lines to see if there were racial differences in perceived uh, professionalism. So we found that for amongst male participants um, in the non code switching condition, where the coworker in the email reported that they did not code switch, we found that black men in the study reported significantly higher levels of perceived, perceived professionalism for this individual than white men in the study. However, in the code switching condition, we did not find a racial difference between um, black and white men. And overall, we did find that across race though, uh, participants did associate more professionalism for the black target individual in the um, study who did engage in code switching. And then for females um, in the study, we found an almost nearly identical effect where in the non-code switching condition, black women reported significantly higher perceived professionalism for the coworker they evaluated in the study compared to white women. Um, and then for the code switching condition, we didn't find a statistical significant difference between the two racial groups, but overall, both groups did associate higher levels of perceived professionalism for the um, individual, the black coworker who did code switch. So in addition to our primary outcome for perceived professionalism, we also wanted to know if there were different levels of agreement for those three different attributes of code switching, which were name selection, style of speech, and um, hairstyle. So the most interesting results were for the hairstyle, and that's where our, we found a strong racial difference. So I'll really dive into those results and share those with you. Um, so once again, so sorry, that should say black male coworker um, in this study. Um, so in the non-code switching condition, we found a similar pattern where black men reported higher levels of agreement for the more natural hairstyle for the um, black male coworker at this law firm than their white male counterparts. Um, and in the code switching condition, we did not find a racial difference between these two groups. However, I will point your attention to the large, the much larger increase in agreeability with the selected hairstyle for white males so looking within race amongst white participants. We see much higher levels of agreement for the code switching condition compared to the non-code switching condition. And we see less of a change uh, for black participants. Now looking at female participants um, in the non-code switching condition, we see that black women reported significantly higher levels of agreement with the natural hairstyle compared to white women. And then in the code switching condition, we find the exact opposite effect, where now white women report significantly higher levels of agreement to the code switching variant of hairstyle compared to black women. All right, so implications of this research. Um, so I wanna point out that code switching. So code switching is a very common practice for many people. 
in particularly in which code switching to distinguish between your casual behaviors and your professional behaviors. So this is very standard code switching that nearly every employed individual in this country engages in. However, racial code switching is a different aspect from standard code switching because for racial individuals, now for individuals from marginalized racial ethnic groups, the stakes are that much higher for racial code switching because that code switching is to, it's in the, it's in the spirit of being treated fairly. So to convince other individuals who may implicitly or explicitly see them from a racialized lens that falls within the perspective of those negative stereotypes, that code switching is much more pivotal to be treated fairly and perceived as an individual outside of that negative stereotypical perspective. So with that in mind, the stakes for racial code switching for ethnic minority individuals are much higher than the more standard racial code switching that they naturally also engage in between casual professional and that all other individuals engage in. And then along the lines of racial code switching, Code, this code switching presents a double-edged sword where we're finding that there are clear benefits to this code switching. We see these both um, in occupational benefits um, and even some psychological benefits in terms of impression management and how individuals feel that others perceive them more positively when they code switch. But at the same time, I wanna emphasize that racial code switching is not easy. So imagine presenting yourself with a completely different personality as a completely different person whenever you're outside of your household interacting with individuals from other racial ethnic backgrounds. That's not an easy task. And to do that, you have to stay consistent in that behavior. So the moment where individuals may slip up <laughs> in that profile that they're presenting, that can then lead them vulnerable to now be perceived negatively. Individuals know they're code switching. So ultimately to code switch effectively, you don't want your audience to know that you're code switching. You want your audience to believe that that is you in your workplace. That's how you are as a person. So that's why code switching presents a double-edged sword, where it has clear benefits. Um, it can lead to many professional and educational you know, outcomes, but at the same time, it comes with major cost, and it is work, and it, and it requires a significant amount of cognitive load to do it effectively. Um, we also find that perceptions of code switch, they do differ based on the specific behavior that's being evaluated, and also based on the race of the evaluator that's evaluating the code switching. So we see that there are different dynamics in terms of whether in-group members are evaluating this code switching compared to out-group members. So I would like to end with another quote to kind of wrap up uh, this work. So this quote comes from a, another black male participant who's 30 years old. And he says, being one of only black slash African-Americans in my department, it is clear that my actions are constantly under a magnifying glass. Due to the questions asked by coworkers, it is clear that they view my presence as a sneak peek into black culture. Therefore, I find myself constantly trying to be aware of my mannerisms to ensure that I don't portray myself or the people I represent in a negative light. So this pressure to now present himself appropriately in settings um, is a major cognitive load that individuals from many ethnic groups, um, particularly those from marginalized ethnic groups have to deal with society. And not only is this a load that they deal with from members of the majority group and trying to acquire fair treatment and respect, but also they wanna interact with members of their own group. If they don't also demonstrate that cultural authenticity by code switching to appeal to their group, then they would be vulnerable to cultural validations. So you can see how these two factors inform one another. So for that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you enjoyed this work and you would like to see or follow along with this work, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Dr. Durkee. And I try to, every time our research lab publishes research, uh, I post it and also retweet research from similar labs. So thank you for your time and attention. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Miles. That was really, really excellent. Um, so I had a lot of questions in here and you kept, you kept answering them, you kept getting to them. So that was really, really awesome. Um, let me just start, if, if I might, at the beginning with that, that first study um, you were talking about with the longitudinal sample, which is really a very clever idea, following uh, young adults as they transition from high school into college and what that's like. I was just wondering if, I know it wasn't the exact within the analysis you were doing, but I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about, if you know, like what, uh, like what the prevalence of these, um, of these cultural invalidations were. And what I'd like to think is that it decreases over time, but maybe that's being naive. And maybe you just, if you know what those, what those numbers look like, if you could just share what they're, what you found with that. Yeah, great question. Um, so developmentally, yes, uh, the rates of receiving the accusations specifically 
does uh, decrease over time. So if we look at over the lifespan, um, so, and we know most of this information are from black youth, uh, but we're starting to get more information from other ethnic groups as well. So pertaining to the acting white accusation, um, black youth tend to experience it for oftentimes the first time during elementary school. So the youngest reports of these acting white accusations in the published research is as young as third grade uh, being targeted for accused of acting white or being an, an authentic member of their ethnic or racial group. These rates then increase uh, during middle school. They hit a peak during high school in which uh, fits with the kind of normal adolescent identity development, whereas youth are trying to make sense of their own identity, one easy way to make sense of their own identity is by making downward comparisons to other individuals so they perceive as less authentic. So right. that for you trying to figure out what being black means, when they see other individuals who go against these stereotypes or expectations, then they're very likely to accuse those other individuals of acting white. Um, so once individuals get to college, college is unique because college naturally is a sorting and a weeding factor where colleges have their own campus climate and their own cultural dynamics, where colleges tend to attract more similar students to the same campus for a reason, because they like the culture and the dynamic of that college campus. Uh, so we did find that the vast majority of our sample did re receive the active accusation during high school. It's upwards of, I believe it's higher than 85% of the sample receive these acting accusations during high school. During that first year of college, those rates then drop down to about only about like half the sample. So they get much, uh, they're becoming less frequently. Mm -hmm. But I do wanna note out that although the rates of being accused during college do decline, the severity and the consequences of the accusations still sting just as much, if not more. So mm -hmm. we see the rates overall of how frequently they're being accused do decline during college. But even though they may occur less frequently, it still hurts just as more because when it does occur in college, it's likely to occur from another individual who similarly was accused of these cultural validations during high school. So they're using it intentionally. They can use it specifically to, sometimes for just describe it as putting someone in their place. So yeah. if there's a member of the group who may think that they're better than other members of the in-group or is starting to behave in a way that's condescending, this particular cultural validation can be used as kind of a way to kind of cut them at the knees to kind of bring them down a peg in a way. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's great. All right. Really interesting. And all right. So then the other question I had was about, I'm trying to figure out how to formulate this, was uh, related to the same study on this really interesting interaction you found on, um, on uh, cultural invalidations and the perpetrator. And then you found that um, uh, the term, uh, the, the, it was race identity was mm -hmm. protective. I want, let's see if I can restate this finding. You can tell me where <laughs> I straight. Um, the race identity was protective, but only when the perpetrator was of another race or, the, or a white race, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. remember. Um, so that was, that, that yeah, made a lot of intuitive sense. And then you mentioned that uh, for an area of future directions, uh, if I understood right, was to look at what might protect individuals from when the perpetrator is the same race. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if maybe, I, it sounds like this research hasn't been done yet, um, but maybe, do you think you could speculate about what might be uh, protective of, of individuals when, they, when they're on the receiving end of this from someone from the same race? Yeah, so that is the billion dollar question that we're trying to answer right now. And so we know that individuals, they are deploying coping mechanisms regardless. That's just how the psychological mind works. When you have a stressor, we have to deal with that stressor. You can try to suppress it for as much as, or as much as you wish to suppress it, but ultimately you have to address that stressor. That's the elephant in the room. Um, so we want to know of what are the ways that they cope and respond to these acu acting white accusations when it is a member of their same race. Uh, one way is that do they confront the perpetrator? Okay, are they motivated to actually kind of in, in a way that you could say clap back <laughs> to the perpetrators? So will they kind of you know address them and kind of question them of why are you accusing me of this not fitting a negative stereotype? Okay, what message are you essentially pushing there? I think one other dynamic that we're noticing is that um, is the expectation of discrimination to occur in the first place. So I think that's why we see that trend where that centrality is protective only when the perpetrator is a white perpetrator, because it can actually already be that sense of caution and hesitation that 
almost an expectation of discrimination to occur in the first place. So when it does occur, it's much more easier to address it, cope with it when you're already expecting there to be some potential negative treatment, um, which would make sense for students transitioning into a predominantly white university coming from a group that isn't white. You know, there is an expectation that they will likely experience discrimination in that context. So that fits in that way. And that might explain for those who um, only received it from white perpetrators, but had that high centrality, how their mean level of depressive symptoms is actually even lower than the reference group who didn't have that threat at all over that same year period. So nice. that really shocked us as well. Um, but by having that negative racial event, it could maybe in a way occur as a confirmation that yes, okay, these individuals, they weren't being overly cautious or they weren't uh, being paranoid. It kind of in a way validated their expectations that discrimination may occur in that college context. So that's one speculation. Um, so in terms of coping with members from your own racial group, uh, one difficulty that we're, we like to be seen in our qualitative work is that individuals tend to be caught off guard. So one reason is that when you transition into a predominantly white university, the most common dynamic that happens next is individuals tend to seek out safe spaces. And that safe space is typically comprised by members of their own racial ethnic background. You know, areas where they don't expect to be discriminated against, where they expect to be supported uh, in, in that way. Um, but when individuals from that safe space are actually the perpetrators who are now discriminating against them, and they describe these experiences as racial discrimination occurring within the same race, now it can kind of, in a way, blow up their whole world, where it's like the same group that was supposed to be supportive is the group that's now racially discriminated against them. So they have to develop a new racial coping dynamic to deal with it. Um, so we want to know if uh, the rates of um, confronting your perpetrator, if that's helpful when it's a member of the same race. Uh, we want to know if rumination plays a role here. Uh, likely rumination may have detrimental effects or that rumination could be them trying to make sense and work through the information likely leading to identity development. It could go both ways. Um, and we're also wanna look at denial coping. Are they simply just suppressing this negative event and in that way kind of maybe even downplaying the racial identity in the first place? Because if members of their quote unquote safe space or that supportive group are the ones also discriminated against that could push them further away from wanting to identify with their racial identity. So potentially many different ways to cope with it. We just wanna know what are the most common patterns and which patterns lead to more positive psychological outcomes versus adverse detrimental psychological outcomes over time. Great, okay, uh, okay, thank you. And then the, the last question, I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about your uh, current and future research um, that, that you're doing. Do you have a uh, longitude? So I saw you, do, you had the, the survey uh, work, MTurk work, are you going to do any more longitudinal work or are you focusing more on the larger scale studies? Yeah, so we just launched the longitudinal study at U of M um, in the fall, actually, to get at these. So similar to many of the future directions, we're going to be coming from that data collection. So it's amongst um, African-American undergrads at U of M. And we want to know particularly what are their coping mechanisms in response to these acting white accusations. Um, we also want to know how it relates to identity development. Um, and additional work too, we also plan to conduct more work with uh, Latinx individuals as well. And particularly that question of, uh, for the Latinx females, we were surprised to see that there was a statistical disconnect between the acting white accusation and their identity development that wasn't there for the other group. So we wanna know additionally what's taking place uh, for those dynamics. Yeah. And then we're also combining the racial code switching in this work too, to see how it affects college students. Um, Cause even though the work I presented focuses on the workplace, racial code switching is just as expected and relevant in educational contexts as well. Oh, wow, very interesting. Are, are you able to do a lot of this online so it's it can seamlessly be done during COVID or? At this point, we've had to adapt everything online. Yeah, down the road, we plan to move in person where ultimately we wanna measure and evaluate code switching in real time. So by bringing individuals into a lab with confederates, we can induce social environments that have an expectation where you should be code switching in this environment versus environments where you shouldn't code switch. And we wanna know how do individuals adapt and respond in real time. Yeah. So we know that naturally some individuals probably have a lot more experience code switching over their prior life experiences, particularly if they already have went to very racially diverse high schools or educational schools before getting to Michigan. So some individuals may just be more adept at code switching and it may occur, occur just naturally or automatically. Mm -hmm. At the same time, other individuals may know that at a place like U of M where they're expected to code switch or present themselves in a certain way, but it's just not natural to them, that can be much more challenging. So we wanna see if for those who you know, are more skilled and adept at code switching versus those who have to force it intentionally and actively try to do it, and it doesn't occur automatically, if there's additional psychological you know, implications that take place there. Because once again, 
racial code switching is work. I, I have to emphasize it. I can't emphasize it enough, but mm -hmm. it is a high level of cognitive work. Um, right. And that, that focus on that code switching can detract from your ability to perform other tasks as well. Sure, sure, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I really appreciate you hi highlighting at the end, talking about code switching that you know most people do, but then how racial code switching is really fundamentally different. And the, as you're saying, the stakes are much higher. I think that is really helpful distinction. Great. Okay, well, thank you again. That was excellent, Miles. I really appreciate all your time for this. Thank you, it was a pleasure.